Thank you. Uh, in this lecture, which Chantal Signoria and her team have honored me so much by inviting me to give, I would like to address uh, the question of the simple but overwhelming and biologically ingrained experience of beauty, desire, and love. And I would like to explore why it is that these experiences, which are on the one hand exhilarating, can on the other hand lead to despair uh, and uh, depression. And my general answer, which I will develop during the lecture, is that the brain operates by forming concepts. These concepts develop and, uh, throughout life. And a concept that you have of beauty or of love or of a loved person is a synthesis of all the experiences you've had. And one experience alone often does not satisfy the richness of these concepts, leaving one in a permanent state of dissatisfaction. Now, I am a neurobiologist, and my trade has been the study of the organization of the visible brain. So it may surprise some of you, perhaps, that I will be referring to literary texts and artistic works in my talk. And I take, really, my cue from one of the greatest scientists who ever lived, namely Albert Einstein, who wrote in 1916, and I quote, he said, science is nothing more than the refinement of everyday thinking. The physicist, therefore, cannot proceed much further if he, if he confines himself to his discipline. To proceed further, he must attack a much more difficult problem, which is to analyze everyday thinking." Unquote. Now, where do you find everyday thinking about love and beauty and desire? You find it in the experience that we all have. You find it in works of art. And you find it in literary texts about love from ancient times to modern times, which is why I shall refer to them. Let me, at the outset, describe in summary form the experiments in neuro neurology that I'm going to refer to. <clears throat> Basically, these are experiments which are uh, designed to locate activity in given parts of the brain. And this is possible because when cells in a particular part of the brain are especially um, active, their metabolic requirement increases, and so more blood is channeled to that area. And there's a difference in the, properties of magne uh, in the magnetic properties of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, which the cameras around the head can detect. And you can then infer that there was an increase in activity. So it's an inference, but it is an inference which is bene fundata. So let me then explain to you, for, let, me, let me start with beauty. So what you do then with these experiments is to get people like yourselves uh, to come to the lab and look at lots of uh, paintings and listen to lots of musical excerpts and rate each one according to how each individual feels it as uh, beautiful. And when we study beauty, the, 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 the basic axiom of neurobiology and neuroesthetics is that beauty is an experience that all humans, regardless of race and culture and learning, can have, although they may differ in what they consider to be beautiful. So we get ordinary humans. We don't deal with uh, artists. We don't deal with art historians. We don't deal with painters. Because, in fact, the advice given us by the art critics is they know too much. You want to go to the ordinary people. And the same with musical excerpts. They listen to them and rate them. But we don't ask uh, musicians. We simply ask ordinary people of all races and of all backgrounds. So once they have rated all these paintings and musical excerpts, they come back to the lab and look at these pictures again and listen to these musical excerpts again and re-rate them 
and then we can capture where the change in their brain occurs. So let me give you an example of the paintings that many found as beautiful. I get my pointer, it makes it a bit easier. Oh, no, this is not the wrong one, this is the wrong one. This is the wrong one. So, this painting by Ang, the Odalisk, was rated by most people, regardless of their race or culture, as being very beautiful. While this painting by Lucian Freud, entitled, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this painting by Lucian Freud, the benefit supervisor taking a nap, was qualified by most people as ugly. Now, this does not mean to say that this is not a great painting which um, projects the process of decadence and decay and the passage of time. It is a great painting, but the important thing is it was not perceived as being beautiful by the people who were taking part in the experiment. For music, this was rated as beautiful by everybody without exception. which, of course, is probably very well known to you. It is from Mahler's Fifth Symphony. And this next one was rated as ugly by everybody. Which, again, uh, does not mean to say that it does not have fantastic musical qualities. But the important thing is that it was not rated as beautiful. So if you look at the activity in the brain, when people look at visual stimuli, and when they look at visual stimuli, the activity with visual stimuli is in the visual cortex and with musical stimuli is in the auditory cortex. But if you ask the question, where was the activity when they experienced beauty in the scanner, you find that with visual stimuli, in addition to the other areas, there is activity in this region here, which is part of the emotional brain known as the medial orbital frontal cortex. And if you ask the question, where, did they experience, where was the activity when they experienced musical beauty, you find it was in the same place, so that there is sort of an area in the brain which in a way registers beauty in the abstract sense, just as the philosophers of aesthetics speak of beauty in the abstract. They don't speak of specifically of musical or visual beauty, but they speak of beauty, literary beauty, poetic beauty, theatrical beauty, and so on. Now, one of the critical questions that philosophers of aesthetics have addressed for 2,000 years is whether aesthetic judgments can ever be uh, quantified. And the answer is, yes, they can, because if you look at the activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex when people experience visual beauty, you find that the activity there is graded with the declared intensity that people uh, experienced. So for stimuli which they found very beautiful, the activity here is much higher than stimuli which they found ugly. And the same is true with uh, musical beauty. There is a, a simple relationship, quantitative relationship, between the experience declared the beauty of a musical piece and the intensity of the activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex. The Greeks, the ancient Greeks, had a single word, kalon or kalos, to describe both visual beauty or, or uh, physical beauty and moral beauty. And the, an example of the uh, of physical beauty is this sculpture, which is actually a Roman reconstruction of uh, a uh, Greek sculpture attributed to Polycletus. And the beauty of the physique here is counterbalanced by the modesty of the athlete, the victorious athlete. It's called the Westmacott Youth, this sculpture. The victorious athlete with his downturned head, which implies modesty and, and humility. So where is... Is there any correspondence between moral beauty and physical beauty in terms of the brain? 
And the answer is yes, because experiments done in America, not by us but by others, have shown that where people experience moral beauty, for example, a moral beauty would be um, if you are in a scanner you're given, and hungry, you're given the ch chance of having a very nice steak or giving up that steak for a hungry child. In the first case, you satisfy yourself. In the second case, you take a higher moral ground. And the activity in the brain in these conditions occurs also in the medial orbitofrontal cortex. Now, <clears throat> there is another kind of distinction which has not been made in the philosophies of aesthetics, but which, inspired, uh, which I was inspired to make by reading a letter that Oscar Wilde had written to his uh, lover, Lord Alfred Douglas. The letter ends as follows. He says, you came to me to learn the pleasure of life and the pleasure of art. Perhaps I was chosen to teach you something much more wonderful, the meaning of beauty, the meaning of sorrow and its beauty. So it was interesting for us. I don't have the slide here because the paper is still being processed for publication. Uh, the experience of sorrowful beauty, as in the Pietà of Michelangelo, com compared to joyful beauty, as in the Three Graces of Canova, also correlates with activity in the same part of the brain, namely the medial orbital frontal cortex. So the medial orbital frontal cortex seems to be very, very important for the experience of beauty, and the intensity of activity there correlates with the intensity of the felt uh, experience of beauty. Now, there is another kind of beauty uh, which Plato regarded to be the highest form of beauty, namely mathematical beauty. But mathematical beauty is derived from a very highly cognitive source because you cannot go out in the streets and show somebody a mathematical formula and ask them whether it's beautiful. You have to have mathematicians. So we brought mathematicians and uh, we brought together 60 formulae, which they studied and rated, and then they viewed them again in the scanner. And the formula that was found to be most beautiful is for, uh, Euler, Leonard Euler's identity, which links five fu uh, fundamental mathematical constants with three basic arithmetic operations, each occurring once. My colleague in this work was uh, is, the, is the, probably one of the most brilliant mathematicians of our times, Sir Michael Atiyah, and he describes this as the mathematical equivalent of the soliloquy in Shakespeare's Hamlet. The next one is one which most people found ugly. This is Ramanujan's uh, equation, which is expressing the inverse value of pi as an infinite sum. Some mathematicians have written to me to complain that this is, that Ramanujan was of course a master genius and this is an important equation. But that's not the important point. The important point was how was it experienced in the scanner and these people did not rate, the mathematicians did not rate this as beautiful. And guess where the activity is in the brain when people experience mathematical beauty? Why it is in exactly the same place in the medial orbital frontal cortex and the intensity of activity there is in strict relationship to the declared intensity of the experience of mathematical beauty. Paul Dirac, eminent English physicist, wrote in 1933, and I'm quoting him to you more or less verbatim. He said, the theory of relativity imported beauty into mathematics to an unprecedented degree. Before the theory of relativity, the guide to the truthfulness of a mathematical equation or formula was its simplicity. But since the uh, uh, theory of relativity, the guide to the truthfulness of a mathematical formulation must be its beauty. So if you have to choose between simplicity and beauty of a mathematical formula as a guide to its truthfulness, then always go for its beauty. And this has been very, very much prominent in, in the thinking of mathematicians ever since. Now, it is quite clear, of course, that mathematicians develop many, many formulae. They discard many because they don't work. So the question is, what does mathematical beauty consist of? What does that experience consist of? Immanuel Kant said that it consists of the fact that 
a formula suddenly makes sense. It's got this aha moment. You see it again, 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 makes sense. And now you ask, is mathematical beauty really so dependent upon culture and le learning? And the answer is no. Because once you know the language of mathematics, regardless of whether you're Japanese or Chinese or Chilean or English or whatever, you will be able to experience this mathematical beauty because it makes sense to the logical deductive system of the brain. And the logical deductive system of the brains of all of us, of the entire human race, is very similar. So I classify mathematical beauty in the category of biological beauty. There is another reason for emphasizing mathematical beauty, and that is because of the ancient Greeks of Poly Polyclitus, who uh, said that in the design of a sculpture of human beauty, you must be uh, aware of mathematical precision. In fact, he gave us a, a, a formula. One to ratio of s uh, uh, square root of two. You start with the phalanx and you build up the whole body. No blemish is to be tolerated, Polyclitus wrote in the canon, which is his book. And everything must be in proportion and, symmet and symmetry. Symmetria was very, very important. So in a... Uh, painting like this, the uh, uh, relationship between the mouth and the nose, the symmetry of the eyes, all of them had to be in perfect, perfect registration, mathematically determined, if not by a ruler, by the mathematics of the brain, and perhaps other features added to it which enhance its beauty. So, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that the Production of beauty, in a way, is a um, the production of a um, concept or the reproduction of a concept in the brain. And all of us will, of course, accept that a very beautiful body or a very beautiful face must have things in proportion and in symmetry. Francis Bacon, the English painter, thought otherwise. He said that his aim in painting was to give a visual shock. You can listen to him saying it himself. I want to give me a shock. Could we have this a bit louder? Because... because intelligence. No. Just go back. No. Could we have it louder, please? Because no, there's because something life. missing. Okay, well, let me try one more time and then I will uh, quote it. If we can't get it, I'll quote it. I want to give me a shock. Now, shock, you could say, is a form of expression. But what expression it is, I don't know. It's a visual shock. It's not, it's not a, a shock about... Um, it's not a, sto a shock that you could get from a story. It's, a, it's just a, a, a visual shock. And he said that the, the shock he produced was not by intellectual uh, uh, processes, not by symmetries, but by a gut reaction of, of uh, violence. So, here he goes again. I've made images that intellect could never make. I've made images that the intellect could never make. And what were these images? These images were uh, of deformed faces. He subverted, he subverted the concept of faces that is in the brain, and so they are forever regarded by most people, ordinary people, not great experts, as shocking. In fact, Margaret Thatcher, the English Prime Minister, the British Prime Minister, once said when they asked her about Francis Bacon, she said, oh, that horrible man who paints these dreadful paintings. And that is the general view. And in fact, the first exhibition in 1953, the first retrospective exhibition of uh, Francis Bacon, uh, in New York was described as a chamber of horrors. And the last one in London in 2013 was uh, reviewed as a view of private hells. And you can see that Francis Bacon, uh, when he wanted to give a visual shock, simply subverted completely the body, the brain's representation of the body or the face, but he did not play that much with the objects. It was really restricted to the uh, 
bodies and faces. So let us then accept that for beauty, there is a biologically acquired, uh, inherited concept of what beauty, biological beauty must be. But of course, there are variations. As you uh, acquire more experience, you home in on particular types of beauty. The difficulty of reproducing this is not to be found, of reproducing the concepts in the brain, is uh, not to be found in biological texts, but in uh, two great French novels. One is by, by Honoré de Balzac, the Le Chef d'Oeuvre Inconnu, the unknown masterpiece which Picasso liked so much that he bought the apartment in Paris where it was set. And briefly, I have to condense it because of time, briefly the story is of a young painter who's got a very beautiful mistress. And there is an older painter who is trying to represent the perfect beauty of a woman. And he says, it's interesting language, he says, I will descend to the hell of art to find my Venus, who will not be a creature, but a creation. So he paints for 10 years and refuses to show his painting to anyone. But finally, they tell him that he can see the mistress of this young painter, and they strike a deal. He will show them his painting, which he's been working on for 10 years, if the younger painter shows his mistress, because he wants to get this inspiration. He cannot find a means of representing the concept in his brain. And when they go to his studio, and he unveils the painting, they are shocked to find one beautiful leg, but otherwise a mass, a confused mass of lines and colors. And uh, Balzac explained to his future wife, Madame Hanska, he said to her, I wanted, this is, this is, by the way, this novel is part of the series called Etudes Philosophiques, Philosophical Studies. He said, I wanted to portray how the richness of concepts in the mind, he said, but I'll translate to the brain, how the richness of concepts in the brain can interfere with the production of a work of art. The second one is Emile Zola's Le Chef d'Oeuvre, which is translated into English as masterpiece. It's not the best translation, but it is very similar, except it's much longer. And both of them are worth reading because they are, the, uh, they are not only literary documents, they are actually neurobiological documents, which tell you a lot about creativity and more than you will find in any, any uh, 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 scientific uh, uh, paper. So uh, the story is roughly similar. Again, there is a painter. He uh, meets a young woman in distress in Paris, takes her to his home, and soon they become lovers. He is trying to paint the perfect beauty, the perfect woman, and thinks that he can use her as a model. But she is a single model. Uh, she does not correspond to the concept in his brain of the synthetic beautiful model. So he starts taking lots of other models, so a lot of other women, she gets jealous and uh, the story goes on. He cannot finish his work. Uh, people thought that Emile Zola had written this against his friend Cezanne, uh, because Cezanne also had many paintings unfinished. But it is not true, I don't think, because Emile Zola also speaks of writers who cannot finish their work because of the richness of concepts in their brain. And as with Balzac's novel, uh, Emile Zola's hero finally unveils his painting to all, for all to see, and they are shocked by the horror of what he has been working on for years, and he too commits suicide. So, this despair of not being able to produce the perfect work of art, the, of beauty, of course, the function of art is not only to produce beauty, but beauty is uh, and, uh, something which many artists have strived for. The despair uh, in not being able to produce it, which uh, is documented in literary uh, texts, is really due to uh, something which these literary people, Balzac, Zola, and Cezanne, and others, understood too well. It is the richness of concepts in the brain, which is not satisfied by one 
or several examples because it is far too rich for them. Now, the incapacity to come with the perfect work can be a life-giving force of creativity as Beethoven in the Heilingestar Testament wrote, it would have taken little for me to put an end to my life. It was only art which held me back. But for others, it is an impetus to try and produce more. One of the greatest master geniuses of Western art is, of course, uh, Michelangelo. Uh, and Michelangelo left three-fifths, three-fifths of his work unfinished. His inspiration, he said, was the Torso Belvedere, this one which you see here, which is in the Sala Belvedere at the Vatican, which Winkelmann, by the way, thought represented the essence of Greek art, which he summarized. Uh, Johannes Winkelmann, who's the uh, father of art history, uh, he said that it personifies Greek culture, which on the one hand consists of the calm and sensuous contemplation of nature, and on the other, of the use of brute force to annihilate anything that comes between the contemplator and the sensuous contemplation of nature. And it is reputed, this was apparently unearthed in the presence of Michelangelo, it's reputed that Michelangelo wept when he saw it and he said, this is my, must, uh, my, my teacher. Now, Michelangelo, as I say, left three-fifths of his uh, uh, sculptures unfinished. This is San Matteo. And the most famous of these is the Pietà Rondanini, which is in the Palazzo Sforzesco in Milan. People have told me that I am mistaken in thinking that Michelangelo left things deliberately unfinished, that he was a very busy man, he had many commissions, and that's why he left them. Not true. My authority for saying what I'm saying is not the people who've been living since, but the uh, Michelangelo himself. In his Rime, he says, in one of these Rime, I shall leave a work unfinished until I get the divine inspiration from the workshop in heaven. So he says, I'll deliberately leave it unfinished. And Vasari, who wrote a, a, a biography of uh, Michelangelo, said that Michelangelo found time and time again that the sublimity of his ideas lay beyond the reach of his hands. And here you've got a contrast with Beethoven, for whom it was an impulse to, achieve, to create more, because the mighty Michelangelo, the man who, when he, uh, he was told that the Pope, Pope Judas II, has asked to see the sculptor Michelangelo, he said, go and tell the Holy Father that I am Michelangelo Buonarroti, and I admit of no equal and I know of no competitor. This proud man, life wearied and labor hardened, at the end of his life, turned against art. And he wrote in one of his last sonnets, or rime, the following lines which I quote to you. He said, I now know how fraught with error was that vivid imagination that made art my idol and my king. No brush, no chisel can quieten the soul once it turns to contemplate the divine love of him who from the cross outstretched his arms to take us unto himself. See, contemplate, think of the concepts. And there's another important aspect to this uh, sonnet, the uh, Christ uh, taking us unto himself, a, a religious dimension which I'll come to presently. So. There is another important thing about beauty and the unfinished, which is that it allows the spectator, the viewer, to finish it in different ways, according to the concepts in their mind. And a master in this was, of course, Johannes Vermeer. This is the uh, music lesson, which is in the Queen's Collection at Buckingham Palace. And no, pay, no reproduction does justice to it, because it's very, very beautiful. Now, a lot has been written about uh, this painting, about the chromaticity, about the use of perspective, 
But what is most arresting for most viewers and what mo many people have written about is the entirely ambiguous relationship between this man and this woman. He could be her teacher, he could be her friend, he could be her pupil, he could be her husband, he could be her lover. They could be talking about a separation or a reconciliation. All these scenarios have got equal validity, so there is no correct answer because all of them are correct, but only one interpretation can be valid at any given time before it seeks place to another interpretation, which is valid for its own time and then another interpretation. So the neurobiological definition of ambiguity is very different. The one that I'm going to propose for you is very different from the Oxford English Dictionary of Ambiguity, which is vagueness and uncertainty. It's the exact opposite. It is the certainty the certainty of many different interpretations, each one of which has got equal validity. There is no correct interpretation, but each one can occupy the conscious stage for a given uh, moment in time. And so, if you want to define great art, re representation of beauty, as one which corresponds to as many different concepts in as many different brains over as long a period of time, then this would qualify uh, in that category. Plato, in his symposium, uh, of course, said something which we all know, namely that something very beautiful leads to a state of desire. And if you look at the uh, brain activity that is produced by desiring something, the fact that all these are Japanese is due to the fact that I did this experiment in Japan. And so you ask people to rate uh, uh, faces, uh, objects, or events according to one thing in the usual way, and then in the scanner they view them again and re-rate them. And you find that the activity in the brain with the experience of beauty, besides the activity elsewhere, is located in the medial orbital frontal cortex, so that the correspondence that Plato and others have spoken about finds a reflection in the uh, correspondence of activity between the experience of beauty and the experience of desire. And just as with beauty, it is the, the intensity of activity, uh, uh, no, no. Yeah, the intensity of activity uh, is in the immediate orbit of frontal cortex with desire is uh, uh, proportional to the declared intensity of the desire. The more desirable something is, the higher the intensity of activity here. This is a very, very important uh, event in, in neurobiology because the experience of beauty and of desire and of love are subjective experiences on the one hand. On the other, the only realities, the only realities that you can be sure of are subjective realities. You can be sure that something is beautiful, but you cannot be sure that I find it beautiful. You can be sure that you love someone, but you cannot even be sure that they love you in return. You may suspect it. But, uh, so it's very, very important that we can localize that activity and that we can show that it is uh, measurable. So, this brings me to the last of the fatal desires. Fatal because you can realize them, but they can also lead to a strong despair. The activations with love. These are done by taking people and asking them to, if they're passionately in love. Students often are. And uh, they bring a picture of their lover and of four other people of the same age and same sex and who they've known for the same amount of time. And they look at these pictures and then you determine where the activity in the brain is. And when you look at that, you find that there's a limited number of areas, the anterior cingulate and uh, putamen insula and, and uh, caudate and putamen. The names don't matter. This is a small number of areas which are especially active, which does not mean to say that these areas act alone. I mean, when people accuse us of reductionism, they're being extremely silly. We always make a point of saying these areas do not act alone, but they are critical, all right? And let me also emphasize that it doesn't matter whether the love is between a heterosexual couple 
or a homosexual couple or a lesbian couple. At the level of love, the picture that you get from the activity in the brain is identical. And then there is the deactivation with love. So large areas of the brain are deactivated. And this includes areas such as the frontal cortex, which are critical for judgment. So what does this mean? It means that your judgment of uh, the madness of love that people have spoken about, your judgment of the person you love, you, you tend to be less judgmental about the person you love and about other, thing, about other people, as something which we all know from experience. So a great mathematician may be, maintain his uh, judgment of mathematics intact, but be less judgmental about um, uh, the lover. And so, it is quite important to realize that in matters of love, uh, biology has designed things. So, so if, you, if you tell your son or daughter or friend, are you crazy, you're going to marry this girl, she's not of your class, she's not of your nationality, and so on, it's wasted. It's wasted. Because they are not capable of exercising judgment. And the reason, that the biological reason, is that the variability is the bread and butter of evolution and evolution cannot tolerate a situation where people intermarry only within the same class or the same uh, nationality and so on. Uh, the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church does not allow, of course, um, divorce, but uh, a, a jurist in the, in the Vatican wrote to me, Dr. Tinti, and she pointed out to me that the Catholic Church allows for the annulment of a, of a marriage if it can be shown, and I quote, that one or both parties could not exercise the discretion of judgment when the marriage was contracted. And when can you not exercise the discretion of judgment? Why, when you're in love. So the last thing you want to do if you're passionately in love is not to get married. So, and the French are very reasonable. They have the mariage de raison, marriage of reason, and the mariage d'amour, marriage of love. The latter is to be very, very carefully considered before one in, uh, indulges in it. Now, the maternal love, so the love of a mother for her child, actually also corresponds to a large degree. Uh, it leads to activity which is very similar to romantic love. There are differences which I will just uh, point out to you very briefly on this. For example, the periaqueductal gray, which is very critical for uh, breastfeeding, is active in maternal love but not in romantic love. The hypothalamus, which is very important for sexual activity, is important in romantic love but is, is evident in romantic love but not in maternal love. But there is another uh, area I'm going to skip. Well, no, why skip it since I brought it here? So this area here, the media orbital frontal cortex, is also active when you view your lover or your child. But there is another area here in the posterior cingulate cortex which is deactivated. It is deactivated. Now, in other experiments done by other people, this area is active in a very singularly important condition when you consider love. It is active when you are asked to distinguish between yourself and others. In this case, with love, with romantic love or with maternal love, it is deactivated as if you are no longer capable of distinguishing as precisely between yourself and others. And that, of course, the unity in love is the main concept. Uh, now, there's something, there's something which is jumping. It is not, honestly, it's not my fault. Okay. So, um, the, the concept of uh, what is the biological concept of love? There is no biological document which tells you what it is. You've got to go to literary texts and get it from the great lovers in literature. And one of the uh, uh, very simple one-page expositions of that concept of uh, love is in Arthur Rambeau's uh, uh, Comte. And it is really the story of a prince who, uh, is, who wants to experience the essential uh, 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 exhilaration of love. 
He has all these women coming out. He chases them. He throws them out. They come back. He tortures their houses. They come back. And one day, so, so uh, uh, he wanted to, he voulait voir la vérité. He wanted to experience reality, the hour of desire and the essential satisfaction. And one day, while he is out galloping in the forest, he meets a Jenny. And from the, this meeting, uh, he, uh, but from the physiognomy of this Jenny and his comportment, he sees the picture of uh, the satisfaction of his essential desire. So they come together, but they die. What happens is that the, the, the Jenny and the prince uh, die together, but they are in fact one person, the Jenny was the prince and the prince was the genie. So they were a single soul in two bodies. And that is the uh, essential, essential concept of love, the unity of two people coming together and becoming one. So uh, that was the essential story, uh, one page long of Arthur Rambo, which exemplifies the biological concept of love, which is the unity with the lover. Now, can we find evidence for this in other texts? Well, the answer is yes. One of the most important texts is the legend of Majnun Layla. Now, Majnun Layla, was, its origin is from uh, Umr al Qais, who was Arabian, but it's mo the more uh, uh, important, well known version is due to a Nazari poet called Nizami. And it is well known to every taxi driver and ice cream vendor from Istanbul to Bangladesh. We don't know it quite well, but they know it very well. So what is the story? The story is of a man who falls in love, man majnun, which, which means mad, appropriately, uh, uh, falls in love with a woman called Layla, which means night, but he's prevented from marrying her. So he gets very depressed and goes to a, um, a cave with animals, and lives in this cave all his life. And then one day, they bring him Layla. And they say, here is Layla, the girl you want, the girl you love. He says, take her away. My concept of Layla is so much more beautiful than her that I will live with my concept alone. Right? That his concept, are, and he requires, he wants unity with uh, Layla, but he, he wants the unity with the Layla of his mind. Now, if you go to the Hindi legend of Krishna Radha, Krishna, the god Krishna, the reincarnation of Vishnu um, in, in, in Hindi culture, he falls in love with a cow herdess. And this cow herdess is married. And uh, Krishna himself has married many, many women. He's a womanizer, in fact. But this Marriage is special. It is a unity uh, of two souls, but it is a unity of two souls in afterlife. And today, even today, when you speak of Krishna in the strict Hindi tradition, it is not acceptable. You must speak of Krishna Radha. And in the... Is it? Oh, well, I was doing quite well without it. So I can <laughs> 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 and, uh, I think we can dispense with it really now, uh, except for the last slide. So the, um, then there is the, uh, the bhakti tradition, the bhakti tradition, which is the development of the um, uh, Hindi tradition, um, where the unity with the lover was so important that one, the male lover was prepared to take a passive role during the act of sexual union. And the female take a, a, a positive role because there should be no distinction between them at all. Uh, but the unity, again, of souls, is, what was important was the unity of souls in the afterlife. Now then you come to Jalaluddin Rumi. Now we're going to do the Islamic Sufi tradition. And Islamic Sufi tradition illustrates very well what uh, 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 I think his name was Peter Conrad, wrote, he said that <clears throat> um, love is not the calming and reconciling therapy of adjustment to oneself and to one's society, but the riveting experience of self-obliteration 
an estrangement from society that the great lovers in literature have known it to be. What does Rumi say about his lover, who was a man, who he met by chance, and uh, Shamsuddin Tabrizi, so Rumi met Shamsuddin Tabrizi, who asked him a question, and Rumi fell passionately in love with him, and he wrote, what is to be done, O Muslims, for I do not recognize myself? I am not Christian or Jew or Muslim. I am not of this earth. I am not from the north. I am not from the south. My time is of the timeless, and my place is of the placeless. But if ever I see you, Jalal uh, Shamsuddin, then I trample upon the world for one hour with you, and my joy is restored. He is isolated. He's completely isolated. And the greatest, uh, let me just say that, that in, the, uh, uh, in Farsi, because it was in Farsi, there is no genderization. So uh, they don't speak of male and female. You cannot uh, get it from the words. And there is no capitalization. When it is translated into English, um, he is given a capital H, which means God. And this is entirely wrong because the ambiguity in the Farsi literature is part of its strength. In the uh, Muslim Sufi tradition, uh, the only God, only God can create beauty. Therefore, by looking upon human beauty, you become closer to God. And uh, God is everywhere and is big, and therefore there is this unquenchable desire to know him, which you can never do. Just as there is an unquenchable desire to know your lover, which you can never do. And the metaphor used was the um, um, ocean of the soul. So you've got these waves, which are ephemeral, which pass away, and then they are absorbed into the vast, unknowable ocean beyond. There's a big, big uh, ambiguity, which is not to be resolved by cheating on language, in the love of a person and the love of the only, uh, only entity that can create that person, namely God. And you find this not only in the uh, Sufi tradition, but also in the Christian tradition. For example, St. John of the, of the Cross said, wrote, was a, Jesus, 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 my bridegroom, let me marry you. Right. So the allusion there is not to be misinterpreted. Now, I uh, hope that it, this is working because I want to go to the greatest of all documents. So you see, I could manage these. I want to go to the greatest of all documents concerning love, namely the legend of Tristan and Isolde, uh, which is... Uh, which has had many, many interpretations, but its most well-known interpretation is uh, to be found in the uh, music of Wagner in the opera uh, uh, Tristan Isolde. For those who do not know, let me just briefly describe that the, uh, Wagner wrote to his father-in-law the following letter. I quote, Since never in my whole life have I known the real happiness of romantic love? I mean to erect the greatest of all monuments to this most wonderful of dreams." Unquote. So he wrote Tristan and Isolde. And basically, it is of two people who, are, who fall in love, but discover that what they really want is to be united into a single person. And this is not possible to achieve, and therefore they yearn for death. So, uh, Tristan and are given a love potion in Act 1, and in Act 3, Tristan says, I curse that potion. Instead of giving me happiness, it has given me eternal damnation. And he tears off his bandages before a happy ending can supervene at the end. And um, uh, Isolde also wishes for happiness. The last words of the opera are, Hoekster used utmost rapture in death. Now, the music of Tristan is quite spectacular if you have the patience. Uh, it is the, his, the notes, Wagner's notes for the first performance of Tristan, uh, which was actually played five years after he finished writing it because it was very difficult to, to comprehend. He wrote that it, the prelude represents 
all the stages of romantic love, from the first timidest shudder to the most terrible outpouring of an avowal of hopeless love, until this falling back helplessly upon itself is finally extinguished in death. There are many interpretations which have been given, but the one which I would like you to listen to very briefly is the one, uh, one I have chosen is by von Herbert von Karajan in his uh, 1972 production, because the reason I'm attached to it is uh, partly because of superb musicianship, but partly because I asked von Karajan what was the concept in his mind when he had a stage which was completely empty. He said to me, I wanted to heighten the sense of loneliness where you would least expect it, namely in romantic love. So there are, two, there are two important points about it. First of all, the chord itself is left unresolved until the end of the opera, four and a half hours later, leaving you in uh, anxiety. So the irresolution and indecision, as in love, and the second point is the long moments of silence where you can um, uh, uh, feel the irresolution. And someone once wrote, has anyone composed silence more beautifully than Wagner? So, I don't know whether it's going to work. Seven seconds. So, there's been no more wonderful representation of the hesitation, of the nervousness and the development and final despair in romantic love. I think when you reach the last note of the coda of Tristan and Isolde, everything that needs to be said about love has been said. In the second act, which is uh, often regarded as a sort of a representation of a uh, a, a sexual union. In fact, it is that is contradicted by the libretto when Isolde says, I am no longer Isolde, I am Tristan. And Tristan says, I'm no longer Tristan, I'm Isolde. And he explains to her the importance of the und, the and, that brings them together. And finally, they hope to find that union which they cannot find in, in life, that biological concept which they cannot find in love in death after life. And now I come at last to the final person, which is uh, uh, Dante's La Divina Commedia. Now, Dante all his life was uh, intoxicated by a woman, a girl, whom he met when he was 11 and she was 9, Beatrice. And, he has, and the, the, the inspiration for the Divine Comedy is Beatrice, although he discusses lots of other things besides. 
But people think that Dante wrote about Beatrice, but that's not true. What Dante said in his first book, La, La, La Vita Nuova, The New Life, is the following. Io spero di dicere di lei, la gloriosa donna della mia mente, quello che mai non fu detto da alcuna. I hope to say of the glorious lady of my mind what has not been said of any woman. Now, notice he's saying the lady of my mind. Of course, throughout his life, she was dead at the age of 14. He uh, froze her memory. It did not develop. He had this concept, but the concept developed in his mind. It was not blemished by reality. Right? So he wrote of the glorious lady of my mind. And you find, again, the same theme of the hopelessness of being able to sing her praises in art as he developed. So in the last canto, the 33rd canto of the Paradiso, he says, Dal primo giorno che vidi il suo viso in questa vita, the, from the first day that I saw her face in this life, my song of her has not ceased. But now I must stop, for so rich are the concepts and so poor the means of representing them that I must fail, as every artist must. And so, in the end of the last canto, canto 33, he, faltering and failing, just like a mathematician who tries to understand the beauty of a circle, this is his description, he does not try to understand the concept of love anymore, but simply abandons his will and desire to the love that moves the sun and the other stars. L'amor che muove il sole e l'altre stelle. These are the last words of the Divine Comedy. So, what I have tried to do in this lecture is to tell you that the machinery of the brain, which is, gives us such a marvelous efficiency in seeing, in understanding, in perceiving, it does that through concepts, but there is a price to be paid for that, which is that the incapacity, especially manifested in love and desire and beauty, the incapacity of representing the richness of concepts in the brain, and the evidence for that you will find in works of art and in what artists have said. The last words, uh, or the last the person I should mention really is Sandro Botticelli. Sandro Botticelli illustrated each one of the cantos of... Uh, uh, uh-oh. Well, <laughs> let's, let's forget it. Sandro Botticelli illustrated each one of the cantos of uh, 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 Dante. But when he came to the last canto, he left an empty page leaving it to the imagination of the reader to create his own concepts because there's no means of representing them. So on that silent page, which is nevertheless imaginably rich, I thank you very much for sharing an hour with me. <laughs>